Hey, thank you. <clears throat> Thanks so much. Yeah, wow, I love being here. I, I, it, it's just so hard for me to be away from my church family on a Sunday morning. I love them so much, and it's, it's, uh, uh, they're having a really great morning there, but um, thanks, Richie. Wow, you did great at that. <laughs> hey, so uh, my wife is our worship leader, and the time that our band spends preparing for Sunday mornings, working on the songs, talking, interacting about what God wants to do through the songs, it's, it's a lot. And this is after full-time jobs, you know, they, they practice on Thursday nights. And Jasmine... Can I coach you guys just a little bit? Is that okay? Can I just offer a little bit of pastoral advice this morning? Jasmine just did exactly what I was going to say when I came up about what the band did this morning. And we as churches, uh, just in the last few hundred years, have struggled to know whether we're supposed to clap and cheer or be sacred and reverent. And so there's just constant perpetual confusion on this issue. And listen, God wants us to cheer and clap. So Jim, right, Luke, Graham, AJ, Emmanuel, Christy, Richie, they led us in worship this morning. And man, thank you guys. Thank you so much. Now, we're going to pray for Pastor William. This is his last week of a much-needed sabbatical. And uh, I love this guy. He's become such a good friend of mine. Such an encourager to me. So would you stand with me? God, we're so thankful for the pastor who leads this church. He is a friend. He loves people so well. And most of all, his heart is devoted to you. We ask you to have him return here rested, energized, excited. And we are thankful for the way he serves this, this group of people, this community of faith, this church. We ask you to care for him and his family. And uh, God, I pray that the year ahead will be the best yet, the most exciting yet. All because of you, Jesus. Amen. Okay, go ahead and grab your seat. It's a special morning here for me. We're going to consider our approach to the table that Jesus invites us to. It's one of the most remarkable. If you're, if you're used to church, if you grew up in church, or if you've been in church for any number of years, it really can just kind of start to feel ritualistic. And yet, it's a memory aid. It's a visual aid that Jesus gives us. He's very practical. It's almost like college professor kind of tool that he gives us when he invites us to the table that we would hold something we would actually hold two items that would have us think on something that he has done. And not only think on, but, but, but act and take into ourselves this remarkable moment. It's the kind of God that we, we're pursuing, that we're learning about, that we're investigating. Maybe you're here investigating today. So I want to go all the way back to the very beginning, Genesis chapter 1. God is creating, everything is good, everything is perfect. There's no disease, there's no aging, there's no decay. Life is pulsating. Life with life. That's the context that we're told. It's life is to reproduce life, and there's nothing other than just life. And God's response is, this is good. This part of my creation is good. It's this emphatic he repeats over and over, look how good this is. And then he comes to the supreme object of his creation, the one, the one part of the universe that would be made in his own image, humans. And he speaks for the first time to humans, and when he does, we're told in Genesis 1, 28, God blessed them. And we often don't know what that word blessed means, and we've, we spent a little bit of time on this earlier. We say, God bless you when people sneeze, and sometimes we just have uh, pictures that hang in homes that say something about blessing, or may God bless this house, or those kinds of things. And it's amazing how few of us know what this means. This is, this is the Hebrew word barak, 
And Barak meant to offer a present or gift while kneeling. That's what it means to bless. To offer a gift in such a humble posture that you're actually kneeling. You're excited and there's this reverence in offering this gift. And God blesses humans. We think it's the other way around. Humans are created and they... God's first words, he blessed them, and he said, be fruitful and increase. The blessing was that you and I would be life givers. Every word we speak, our actions, he says to rule and subdue the earth. That's not an authoritative rule. That's a creative rule. Go into the world and create in the image of me, the creator. This is Genesis 1. This is the way it's supposed to be. We are created in the image of the blesser, the one who would be so ready in every moment to offer gifts of life as he has done. And then we humans messed it all up. And, you know, if I, use, if I can use some raw language here and say something like, we blew it all to hell. Literally, that's what we're told in Genesis 1, 2, and 3. The earth is introduced to this concept of hell. Separation from God. Separation, distance from God's blessing. God's perpetual blessing. Now we have, immediately in Scripture, murder happens. Envy. Lying hiding from God, and the story of humanity in the first 11 chapters of Scripture is us spiraling down into this mess in chaos. So much so, we don't even understand what life is anymore. We don't know if there's a God, if there's a creator. We, total, total chaos. And already in chapter 12, Genesis chapter 12, we see the beginning of God's rescue plan. Now, I don't know about you, if you're God and we're not, I mean, it's you know, uh, risky to kind of think that way because we're not supposed to think like God. That's what got us in trouble in the first place. But if you, if you do sort of imagine like if, if this were you and you created all this good and you bless, you're the God creator and yet you kneel and give humanity this gift of life, perpetual life. And we wreck everything the way we do. That, there's part of me that thinks, you know, I think I might just go somewhere else and start over. That's really the, the root of agnosticism. That concept that God exists, but he's not here anymore. He went somewhere else. I don't know what you would do. But God moves toward us with a rescue plan. He's going to rescue earth. So much so that he's going to re return planet Earth back to the original state of the garden, of what he intended all along. And he's going to rescue humans. So in Genesis chapter 12, he says to Abram, the one human being who has recognized how life works and what the source of life truly is, it's creator God. It's not the things that we make that we begin to worship. It's not my own life or plan or agenda, it's the one who created us. When we revolve, when we, when we cycle and circle and revolve our lives, our being around him, that's the source of life. And so the Lord says to this man of faith, go from your country, your people and your father's household to the land I will show you. This is already hinting, this, this talk of land, this is hinting at the promised land, the promised land would be a physical, literal picture of the Garden of Eden, returning to what God uh, uh, intended from the beginning. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. Isn't that interesting? God's back into blessing again. This is his plan. It was his plan from the beginning, and he's already reintroducing broken, chaotic humans to the calling of experiencing God's blessing. I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. Living, walking, breathing in my image. 
and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. God's not telling Abraham, hey, I'm going to create my favorite group of people, the Israelites, out of you, and I'm only going to care about them. And really, it's just, what's important to me is what happens to the Hebrew people, the Israelite people. That's not what God is saying. God is saying, I'm, I'm going to establish a group of people, a nation, from you, Abram, and they, if they walk in my created nature, if they begin to center their lives and their existence around me and my purposes, they will be a blessing to every nation. Every people group on earth will know of my character, will know of my plan, my love, because of, because of your faith, Abram, because of your descendants. And then comes the blessing, the actual physical blessing of Isaac. It's a long story. We don't have time this morning to get into just how old Abraham and Sarah were. But Sarah's name, she's named Laughter. She's laughing, almost sort of on the edge of mocking God, like pregnant at my age. And yet it happens. And they give birth to Isaac. And here is the beginning of the rescue plan actually coming into existence. Wow, a people group is emerging from this old, this old couple, just like God said. And this takes us to the part of the rescue plan, 10 chapters later in chapter 22, that is the single most challenging conversation I have with people when I meet to talk about faith. There are a couple of big, big, big topics that people want to sit and talk to me about in what keeps them from faith, what keeps them from trusting God, what keeps them out of church. One is how churches have become known for being against so many different things and so many different kinds of people. And another is they read the beginning of the Bible, and they get to Genesis 22, which we're going to read here, and they cannot fathom that a good God would ask a man to do what we're going to read here in just a moment. It's so morbid, it's so twisted, so many people have told me, I mean, I used to count, I was like, wow, this is the third person who's told me this. I meet at Starbucks with somebody grappling with faith, and then, wow, this is the seventh person, and then I've lost count. So many people who take a risk and start to read the story of God in Scripture, they get to chapter 22 in Genesis, and they close the Bible and walk away in frustration and essentially say, I never want to follow a God who would ask that of humans. And so I thought the week before William comes back, we would uh, tackle that (laughs) subject this morning. Okay, So I'm going to read the story and just dump the problem the moral and ethical problem on you, and then I'm going to leave. <laughs> and then you guys can welcome William back and take him to coffee and say, what, what in the world is God doing here? Genesis 22, verse 1. You understand the, the, the rescue, the blessing. We are to be people of blessing. And now Isaac is the first. His son is the first of what will become this people of blessing. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. All right, let me just stop right there, one sentence into the story. You ever wish God's testing was different? Like, like maybe he wanted to see how many free throws you could make, you know, on the, on the basketball court or something like that. Or, or could you name the U.S. presidents in order? Or something, if that seems boring, the Marvel Cinematic Universe movies in chronological order. Wouldn't that be the kind of test that would be sort of challenging? Like, dang, God, this one's kind of hard. I, I got halfway through, and I, I, I don't remember movie number 13. Why is it that God's testing tests our faith? It tests the very core of our trust in what's real? God said to him, Abraham, here I am, Abraham replied, Then God said, take your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Now, first of all, in our culture today, in the Western Hemisphere, in the 21st century, 
this seems, this seems just morbid on a whole lot of levels. We don't understand a culture like in ancient times where sacrifices were made for all kinds of things, by multiple people groups, different religions. And in God's system of faith and his uh, uh, currency and his culture of faith that he is establishing with Abraham, there is such an idea that an innocent being, a lamb, a ram, would be sacrificed in substitution of the brokenness of the family, of the human family, of the parents and the children. Something innocent would lose its life as substitution of justice for our selfish choosing as humans. But God's asking Abraham to sacrifice not just his son, like how messed up is this, but he's asking him to sacrifice the promise that he himself made to Abraham. And I remember when I was young, I grew up in the church, and I was, I'd get to the story, I'd hear a pastor talk about the story, and it would be so confusing to me. Like, it sort of threw God in my mind. If you've ever done this with God, he just sort of like, God is, you know, Jesus is talking on the Sea of Galilee, the shore, and it's love and forget, and he's, he's welcoming outsiders. But then there's places like this where it's like, oh, now God's in random mode. It's like God's gone random. Don't understand. I'll never understand. He's doing something here that humans just can't. You ever done that? Like you read something or you, you, maybe even you read something in a song that you're singing. Like what? This is one of those random things about God. I used to do that with this story. It is amazing how genius God is being with this story. Early the next morning, Abraham got up. And I, I would expect to read and took his son far away to the in-law's house or got out of there or found a hiding place. Isn't that what you'd expect? I mean, put yourself in this story. The next morning you wake up, do you load the donkey and take with you two servants and your son Isaac and start moving toward the region of Moriah? I don't know if I do that. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. Wow. On the third day, and by the way, there's a lot of symbolism in the story. We don't have time this morning to dive into, but man, look for it. God knows masterfully what he's doing here. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servant, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. Isn't this weird? We will worship and then we will come back to you. I used to read this story as if Abraham had some kind of split personality going on. He believes the promise of God. He knows that Isaac, I mean, he and Sarah laughed into the night that God... He's going to create a nation, a family. In our old age, we have no children. Sarah couldn't have children. And they watch God roll out this amazing miracle. And the promise of God is, you will begin the restorative process, Abraham, of modeling what humans were supposed to be from the very beginning. You will be a blessing. You will are blessed by me, the God that would, on bended knee, offer humans perpetual life in my image. And now you will do the same, Abraham, and all of your family and everyone who descends from you. Abraham trusts us. He sees it happening. And yet, God's now asking him to sacrifice the very promise, not just his son, but the promise that's going to rescue the world. I, um, I went to the beach a couple years ago. It was during COVID. Uh, 
my brother-in-law has a home in South Carolina uh, near the beach, and so we all went. I ran on the beach that morning, the morning uh, that I'm, this awful story happened. Everything was fine. I felt good, and then uh, developed like chills and a fever. Thought I was sick. I mean, I was sick. <laughs> uh, I, I just thought it was like a, a cold kind of thing. You know, we, we start, you know, using the C word like, oh, COVID is negative for COVID. It's such a long story. The, the, the next four weeks of my life were so dramatic, and uh, I probably couldn't exaggerate it if I tried. But I ended up in a hospital in South Carolina, and they couldn't figure out why my white blood count was so high, like scary high. The doctors were like, uh, this is not okay. Like, we've got we've to we've figure this out quickly. And, you know, that's just not what you want to hear on your beach vacation. <laughs> um, so they ended up doing an MRI and discovered I had an infection, like a really mysterious infection, and they, they just weren't sure what to do there. They put me on an antibiotic. It started to work, and then it stopped working. After day one, they realized it's not working anymore. My white count came down just enough. They told me, uh, we think he's in the safe enough range to get him back to Northern Virginia, back, uh, to, to Fairfax. And so I was in the hospital here. And I think it was day two of being in the hospital here where an infectious disease team comes into my room, a team of six people. And they're introducing themselves, and this is what they do. This is what we do. We're, you know, they didn't say we're the best, but you could tell. They were like, this is the team or part of the team. And then they explained to me that none of them have ever seen this infection before. Yeah. I'm glad I can laugh now because, um, and they say, in so many words, we're not, we're not sure how to address this. And so I've skipped a lot of parts and a lot of days to, to get to that part um, to say that I was at one of the lowest points in my life. I have, you know, like everybody, I've, I've been depressed at times about certain situations or circumstances. I've never really been, I've, I've never battled depression like for a long season of life. Uh, there have been things that have scared me at times. I've battled fear in various ways, but this was a couple of hours laying in my hospital bed where I didn't know, I, I'd never thought before, like, wow, my days might be numbered. I've just, I've never, I've never had to face that before. And I, it was COVID. I couldn't see my, my daughters. I couldn't communicate with the church that I lead. People couldn't come see me. I've had this infectious disease team tell me that we're not exactly sure what to do here. And that night, I just sort of collapsed. I mean, I was laying in my hospital bed. It was such a depressing room. I had a window, but the window was behind my bed. And if, if I kind of leaned to look out the window, I, it, it looked out to a brick wall. I mean, everything about this whole experience was just like, it could not be worse. And laying in that bed that night, I was battling God. I've been pastoring for over 20 years. I love Jesus deeply. And my battle was, I don't understand. I, 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 there's no hint in me of what the purpose is in this. At this point, it had been going on for more than a week. I think about a week and a half at this point. And I'm just wrestling with God. And what I, what I realized was, I am fighting for my life. And in fighting for my life, right? Human nature. Like, of course, I was fighting against God. And I just let go. I, I had a choice to make. Be angry with God? This makes no sense. I may never see my girls again. Will I be alive three days from now? You know, I'm doing all of this with God there. Just, just quietly and sometimes out loud. And I just got to the point where I said, God, I can't fight you on this. If I say you're my God, that means you're my God, and that means you're the God of all of me. And you're the God of my body, and you're the God of whether I see my family again. And so I'm letting you be my God. That's, that's essentially, and I, I mean, it was, it was a deep 
sincere, like, I don't want to fight you. I would rather you be my God and go through this than not have you. It was, it was one of those kinds of, you know, moments. And I'm telling you, what, what I wrote later was like a blanket. It was like a blanket, an invisible blanket of peace. Peace, like peace, rest. Where I told my wife later, suddenly the world was right. All was right, even though it wasn't right. I, I had a sickness that doctors a couple hours earlier told me I may, they didn't say you may not survive this. They didn't use that language, but they were telling me they didn't know how to solve it. I was not right, and yet everything was right. Have you ever experienced this? It is, a, it is the beautiful place to live your life. It is the place where you and I are supposed to live and relate to the world, is in the place where God is God, no matter what. And even if it turns out badly, it will turn out good because he is good. And I don't know how to stand here this morning and explain that to you. It is something deep in my spirit that I knew in that moment. Even if this ends badly, all is good because I've surrendered really surrendered my body and my life to Jesus. I slept that night, through the night, the first time in a week and a half since this started. I mean, I really slept. It was like, finally, I got sleep. And then the next morning, one of the infectious disease doctors comes in, just sort of like casually, like he's just, you know, like, would you like a Pop-Tart? I mean, he didn't say that, but that's sort of like, he's just sort of, he didn't skip into my room, but, you know, like, I'm, I'm thinking my life is in jeopardy. He's like, hey, I wanted to stop by and tell you real quick. Our team whiteboarded last night after we talked to you. We went to a whiteboard. We think we know how to solve this. He's like, we'll see you a little later. Somebody's going to come check. And sure enough, they tried this injection, and it's a long story. But it worked. The antibiotic that they tried worked. But even if it hadn't worked, the world was right because God, creator, who turns ugly and broken and bad into good, it's all he does, it would have been good for my family, for people who knew, knew me, know me. Again, it sounds like, well, no, it would have been tragic if it hadn't worked out. It, even in God's hands, tragedy is turned to beauty. Abraham is the first character of Scripture to reveal this to us, that this is possible of humans, to so trust, to so trust God that he will promise life to you. And out of this promise, Abraham, you wait and see, the whole world will end up blessed because of this promise I'm giving you. Abraham believed that, and he also trusted and believed God wants him to sacrifice this promise now. It's super mixed up. It's counterintuitive. Abraham took the wood. Look at, look at this for symbolism. Talk about foreshadowing. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. This is no accident. God knows exactly what he's doing. Hundreds of years before the arrival of Jesus. And he, Abraham himself, carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up. Yeah, no, duh, I'd be asking this. And said to his dad, uh, Father, yes, my son, uh, the fire and wood are here. <laughs> this reads almost sort of comical. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering, Dad? Yeah, I'd be asking that question. Abraham answered, listen to this answer. God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Abraham knows I am about to sacrifice my son because the God who is God of my life has instructed me to do so. And God has promised that through Isaac will be the rescue of planet Earth, of humanity. Abraham so trusts God that he trusts both. So he tells his son, we're moving here towards the sacrifice, but yeah, God's going to provide a lamb. 
When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there. Now, this is where, you know, in the early days of reading this, before really understanding what's happening, I'm picturing Abraham sort of like, yeah, he's kind of building the altar, like, you know, but he's sort of looking up like, okay, God, well, like, when is this going to stop? He builds the altar. He arranged the wood on it. He bound his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. He is going to do it because he trusts the heart and plan and timing and voice of God. He is so surrendered to God, he's going to go through with this instruction. While believing, this is the promise through which the whole world will be blessed and humanity will be rescued. Eventually through Jesus, through the Jewish people, the Israelites leading to Jesus. But the angel of the Lord called out to him, which is fascinating. Uh, when you study this, uh, biblical scholars, many scholars believe the angel of the Lord reference in the Old Testament. It happens a number of times where not an angel, but the angel of the Lord. There are, there are many scholars that believe that was Jesus. Jesus was the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. That's a fascinating thought, to think that Jesus may be the one, the voice of heaven, calling out, Abraham, Abraham, here I, here I am, he replied. Don't, don't lay a hand on, this, on the boy. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over, took the ram, sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. Access to the extraordinary blessing and life that God is calling us to. Access in your work life on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. In your marriage, in the struggle to be a good parent and a patient parent and all the challenges that come with that. In this life, access to the extraordinary blessing of God is understanding that God will be the one. He will be the father to give up his son. He's setting us up from the very beginning. This is very intentional. If you've ever felt anger reading this story, if you've ever thought, this is just morbid, what kind of God would ask a dad to do this? God is tapping our empathy. He's tapping our emotions. Sitting at Starbucks and listening to someone say, I read Genesis 22. Brad, explain this to me. This is very intentional that God is getting into our emotions so that we will worship on a completely different level of surrendered worship when we realize, ah, he will be the dad to give up his son to sacrifice his son in the rescue plan. It'll be him hundreds of years before when the blueprint of God's rescue begins to be drawn out. He gives us the story to help prepare the human heart that God the Father, God our Father creator, loves us so much that he will be the Father to sacrifice his son on the altar. I'm going to invite the band to come. They're going to help lead us here in these next moments. And I know it's tempting when the band's coming up to kind of watch them, but, but, but keep your ears on this last part. Tune your ears here to what God says here. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Now, we're getting there. We're almost to the punchline here, so keep your heart tuned to this. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, this is surrender language, because you were so surrendered to me, Abraham, no matter what's going on in life, when life doesn't make sense, you're in a situation that just seems so counter 
to what life should look like. Because you trusted me, even in that moment, I will surely bless you. Here's that word again. This is the picture of God kneeling, offering humans a gift. I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies, and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed. This is foreshadowing not just Jesus who will arrive and fulfill the culminate, the rescue plan, but then the church, people who follow Jesus, will actually be the embodiment of this blessing in the world, the body of Jesus. Paul uses this language. You and I will actually, arms, elbows, shoulders, legs, knees, all of us fit together like a body. We are the body of Jesus' blessing for our broken world. All nations on earth will be blessed. God's all about rescue. We're, we're moving back to the garden. The end of the story is we will be in the garden again. This place of creative beauty. No more death. No, no longer saying goodbye to a loved one. No more pain. This is what we crave. We want to live longer because we were made to live. We're craving the garden. And it all begins with us recognizing that Jesus would be the one to shed his blood. Jesus would be the one to be the sacrifice on the altar for our brokenness, for your selfish choosing. That's what sin means. Sin can sometimes sound like bad person. It actually doesn't mean bad person. It means broken, incomplete. Someone who chose selfishly to be God rather than allowing God to be God. Jesus becomes the sacrifice to cover that. That brokenness. And you and I begin the healing process of walking in wholeness, our minds being reset, our relationships being healed, the moment we say yes to the invitation of Jesus to take into ourselves the sacrifice of the Father's Son. So, <clears throat> this is an invitation. We end this morning with what Jesus established that night with his disciples. They did not understand they just thought it was part of the meal, part of the Passover meal. Jesus breaks the bread, and he pours the wine, and he's talking so mysteriously about this is my body. And he leads them before the cross in this visual aid that will help them connect. And we see later, ah, we understand now the broken bread was his broken body. The cup of juice, the cup of wine is his blood spilled, is the lamb, the ultimate lamb. The invitation to the table of Jesus is an invitation to surrender. Everything. You give your life over to the control of God, to the timing of God, to the plan, the voice of God. When life doesn't seem to make sense, you trust. You trust that he knows what he's doing. I can't think of a more chaotic situation than the one Abraham was in. And yet Abraham fully surrendered and trusted. And when we approach the table of Jesus, we are saying, God, I can't explain everything happening in my life right now, but I want you to be leading my life. I want you to be moving me towards rescue and resolution. I want you to be moving me into wholeness because I will only move myself into broken and more broken. We have two tables set here in the front. And I'm going to invite you to come to the front and take a piece of the broken bread and a cup that represents the wine, a cup of, of, of juice. And if you'll return back to your seats, we'll wait until everyone is back in their seat. We're going to worship together. And then I'll come and lead you in the eating and drinking. 
together of Jesus' body and blood. This is an invitation to full surrender to the one who will only lead you into full life and wholeness, which is what we're craving. So with that, you're invited to the table of Jesus. It's amazing that God, in the middle of heartache, what seems like chaos, seems like he's contradicting himself. Ever felt that way? Like, God, I thought, I was feeling your love. I felt so close to you. And then it just seems that he's contradicting himself. I'm working good and a promise in your life. And now I'm asking you to surrender it. He always knows what he's doing. From the beginning of human tragedy, mess, and selfishness, God was moving us toward the freedom we would find, the wholeness we would find in the cross of Jesus. It's just a masterpiece of the story. And to benefit from this sacrifice of our God, we have to surrender. He has to be God. He's not egotistical. It's not an ego deal. It's that he's the source of life. It, it just life only works with him at the center. So he devised this, not just sacrifice for us, but this way for us to remembering when we remember his act on the cross, his sacrifice, we would be laying ourselves down. We often say at the foot of the cross, we surrender before the cross of Jesus. You can't accept the lordship and power of God unless you've surrendered. And that brings us to the table of Jesus. It's genius and it's beautiful. And so with this, I invite you to take the broken bread, which represents Jesus allowing his body to be broken so that you and I could begin the process of walking in the wholeness of God. Let's eat together. seems sacrificing an animal just seems seems like cruelty we don't, we don't we don't understand this in our culture but this is how god views sin human brokenness something innocent must lose its life to cover over our shame and regret jesus giving the wine to the disciples, showing them the symbol of what would represent him being the ultimate lamb, the ultimate sacrifice. It's amazing. So with that, I invite you to drink with me. Before we finish the song, let me pray with you. Father God, There are times where so many of us in this room have been angry with you. There are times that we've thought you didn't actually know what you were doing. You, so, you seem to move toward us with love and stories of beauty only to seem to disappear or become distant. But early in the story of Abraham, you're teaching us as we trust you in every moment, in every challenge, every uncertainty, you are at work creating life. We are so grateful for your table, Jesus, and that you would invite us as guests, as friends, to eat and drink at your table, to make us whole. And now I pray that we leave this room, we leave this building, today as voices of blessing that we would extend 
your life into our places of work, into our homes, into our neighborhoods. This is the ultimate plan for humans, that we would represent you in our lives, perpetuating life. May we walk and speak that way this week. I invite you all to stand as we close this song.